what's your agenda? I don't mean what are you going to do today. I mean what's your agenda? Everyone has an agenda. Or we should. If we've been born again, if we've trusted in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God sets our agenda as showing His love to others that they might come to know Him as Lord and Savior and spend an eternity in His presence along with us. Our agenda is to be gospelers, to tell people that Jesus loves them and died for them on the cross at Calvary and shed His blood. What a blessed thing to have that agenda in this present evil world where people have no hope. Now a lot of you work in small businesses and corporate jobs and you'll notice that a lot of the people you work with have agendas. And when you figure out what their agenda is, you know how to deal with them. And so here's the issue with church. Do people set the agenda when it comes to the things of God? Do we set the agenda when it comes to the things of God? Now, this is a trick question, so don't answer. I'll tell you up front. Every church has an agenda. Every pastor has an agenda. But here's the deal. Who is the church? It's not the building, it's us. So let me clarify this for you. We do not have an agenda in our church. We are the agenda. We are God's agenda. What does He want? He wants us to come as sinners, trust Him as Savior, be born again. He wants us to meet together as a church family. He wants us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He wants us to worship Him, give Him the honor and glory. And He wants to train us in the service and in the Word of God that He can use us in this area to reach out to those all around us that God has set before us each and every day. And He wants us to send out missionaries to places that we are incapable <coughs> of reaching on our own. Praise God. We are the agenda. So, sometimes the pastor, as the leader, he thinks he knows what's best for the church. And I, I think the problem is with that word think. Sometimes we think, and it's simply our opinion, or how we feel. And so sometimes the pastor thinks he knows what's best. And some pastors, believe it or not, do what's best for them rather than what's best for God's people. I've seen that many, many times. Well, then you have the congregation. Well, they want what's best for them. Except everyone has a different need. Everyone has a different idea. And most of the time, when people want what's best for them, it generally coincides with the culture and society. We need to be careful of that. We live in this culture and society. We're reaching people in this culture and society. But we should be people of the book. We should have a Bible-based agenda. So that leads me to the real answer. What is best? What is best? As your pastor, I can't please one person. You don't know how many conversations I've had with people. I wish you would preach topically. No, I liked it when you preached through the books. I liked it when you told stories. No, I liked it when you just gave us scripture. I like singing choruses. No, I like singing hymns. You can't even please some of the people some of the time. It's a losing battle. And so what do I need to do as your pastor? I need to do what's best for our entire church family. Right? Today's Father's Day. <clears throat> what's the quickest way to destroy a family? When the parents and the kids all have their own agenda. And they all do what's best for them. 
No, as the leader of the household, the father, the husband, must do what's best for the family. As your pastor, I must do what's best for the church family. But here's the difference. I need to be in much prayer and seeking God's will and in the scriptures seeking God's biblical guidance. So here's what I will promise you. As your pastor, when I leave this church, just, just as I did with this project and the plan for growth and sustainability, I prayed and prayed and prayed and studied and studied and studied till I was 110% sure of God's leading and I made sure it was scriptural. And it was for the benefit of our church as a whole. And that's the only way to do things properly before God. And so, we need to have priorities. And so I want you, if you're not there yet, to go to Matthew 22, verse 34. In Matthew 22, as is usual, the Sanhedrin, the ruling class of the Jewish theocracy, think about it. The Jews were God's people. He gave them the scripture. He gave them the temple sacrifice. And what did they do with it? They became political and self-righteous. And we are in danger of doing the very same thing in our day. We need to be careful. And so what had happened? The Sanhedrin, they were Herodians, they were the political group. There were Sadducees, they were the liberal intellectual group. And there were Pharisees, we talked about this Thursday night, they were the conservative, legalistic group. And each group tried to trap Jesus. And so we want to skip down to verse 34, because the Pharisees are going to use the Bible. Don't you love it when people use the Bible for their own agenda? When the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Now you all know there's Ten Commandments, right? Ten Commandments. <coughs> and they asked him, tempting him. They're trying to, they're trying to trick him. Think about that just for a moment. A religious, educated group of men are trying to trick God in the flesh. Guess what? You can trick me every day. I'm easy to trick. But you will never trick Jesus. They said, Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? Which one is the priority? And he answers them. And then he gives him another answer. This is what he says. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. So let that seep in for a moment. Jesus said, this is the most important. This is our priority. So think about this for a moment. There's ten commandments. The first Four, lay out our responsibility to God, right? I shall have no other gods before me. The last six, okay, no, four and six, the last six are our responsibility toward man. I can count, don't worry. You need help sometimes. Remember the rich young ruler? Matthew 19. He wanted to get to heaven by doing something. He said, good master. What is the first thing Jesus responds? Why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. What was Jesus doing? He was trying to get him to understand who he was talking to. Remember the woman at the well? 
She said, come see a man who told me all things ever I did. Is this not the Christ? He wanted the rich young ruler to acknowledge that he was God in the flesh. And he said, okay, let's play your game. You want to get to heaven? Keep the commandments perfectly. By the way, I'm the only one that's ever done it, but you want to try? Tell me, which ones have you kept? And he lists the ones towards man. So he's man-centered. So Jesus said, fine, go sell everything, take up your cross and follow me. He went away sorrowful. And so what Jesus is saying here is the entire law, the entire law of Moses is summed up here in two priorities for your life and mine. And the first priority, notice I'm not saying commandment, I'm saying priority, is to love God. How? With all your heart. With all your soul. And all your mind. Where'd she go? I love my wife like that. <laughs> That's how I love my wife. That's how I love my children. And my, oh, she's there. <laughs> I told you you could trick the preacher. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get you back tonight's message. <laughs> Do we love God like this? Listen, your wife and kids, they know if you love them. Well, I don't have to tell them they know. Do they really? If you're not telling them, and you should, then your life better speak loud and clear. And guess what? A lot of wives and a lot of children wonder. But what about God? Do we love Him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind? Oh, of course, preacher. Do we pray every day? Do we know His Word? Do we come to church and worship God from the heart? Do we live for Him? This is our priority. <coughs> God is first. And let me say this. We're Baptists, so we emphasize service. We think serving God is the way to be spiritual. May I suggest to you that worshiping God might be more effective. We put our emphasis on worship. Then the service will be a product of that love and worship. What about our sonship? He says to abide in Him. So the idea here is our relationship with God is the most important thing in all the universe to us. We live for Him. We love Him. We serve Him. We worship Him. It's the most important thing in our lives. God is first. That's our priority. But then Jesus throws in something for free. He says this is the first and great commandment and I'll give you one more. If you can do the first one, you need to do the second one. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So what is he saying? There's two things that guide our life. God and people. God and humans. So there needs to be a balance. And I'll say this about Baptists. We focus on God and neglect the human side of it. And then there's some churches, all they teach is social justice. It's all about man. It's all about us. So we need to be careful here. God expects both. But there's a priority, right? There is a priority. When we emphasize man over God, we've got our priorities wrong. If we emphasize God and neglect our fellow man, we're not fulfilling this. Do you understand what I'm saying? If we would just do things biblically, we'd be a lot happier, a lot more blessed. And so let's think about this. Can we live for God and then show that love to other people. 
You see, if you show his love to other people, that is a that is like a barometer of your success with the first commandment. How do I know I'm fulfilling the first commandment? Because I love you all and you're all crazy. <laughs> Amen, preacher. You especially. Hey. <laughs> it's a barometer of how well you're doing the first one. But we can't get the order mixed up and we can't neglect one over the other. They're both necessary. Do you remember in Matthew 19? After Jesus dealt with the rich young ruler, they questioned him, the apostles. What did Jesus tell them? The twelve of you will rule and reign with me in the kingdom. Remember he said it's as hard for a rich man to go through the eye of the needle? Do you remember what he said? If you forsake houses, lands, mother, father, sister, brother, wives, sons, and daughters. What does he mean by forsake there? He means get your priorities right. You see, I loved my wife when we got married. But I didn't know how to love her biblically. Because I didn't know the love of God. And once I repented and trusted Jesus as my Savior, once I became a child of God and experienced God's love for me, I was able to take God's love and then the love for my wife and my children got elevated to the highest degree. And perhaps I didn't live that out consistently or as well as I might have. But I knew what it was about. <coughs> we need to put Jesus first. If you put anything before Jesus, you've got your priorities wrong. The next thing I want to talk to you about is consideration. When I was growing up, the two men that shaped my life the most were my dad and my grandfather, his dad. And they taught my brother and I each and every day to put everyone around you first. Every day they taught us that. My dad had a construction company. He remodeled apartment buildings. And then when the job was finished, the next summer my brother and I would work for my grandfather, like doing custodial work in the apartment buildings. And my grandfather was always, don't leave a broom in the hallway. Someone will trip over it. Go to this apartment and ask this lady if she needs anything. He was always teaching us to put others first. And it's, it's a hang-up I have. If I go to a restaurant with a bunch of people, I can't eat till I look around and I see that everyone has what they need. I need to make sure everyone's all set before I can relax. That's how I was brought up. And it wasn't a bad thing either. In fact, it was rather biblical. We talked the other night how do you show love to other people? You pray for them. You pray for them. <clears throat> May I say this? It's pretty hard not to like someone you pray for every day. So if you don't like someone, start praying for them. You'll become their best friend. We cannot have the right relationship with God. If we come to church and we've got a problem with someone in church, we can't. That relationship with other people, that <coughs> inherent desire to show God's love to each other, as I said before, is a barometer of our relationship with Christ. If we're experiencing His love, we can't help but to share it with other people. And so... If you have bitterness, 
envy and strife with others, you cannot be right with God. If you're mad at your wife, you cannot be right with God. No matter how many times you pray, Lord, she's a mess, please straighten her out. You won't be right with God until you straighten it out, until you apologize, until you make it right. Go with me to Psalm 66. We'll do a little meddling. Psalm 66. Make, verse 1, make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of His name. Make His praise glorious. This was a hymn they sung. Psalm 66, and down to verse 3. Say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thy enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee, and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Selah. Think of that. What's going on here? The greatest commandment. Right? God is the priority. Worship God. Open your mouth and praise Him. And if you can't sing, I'll give you a harmonica. No big deal. I want you to skip down to verse 13 of Psalm 66. Where do we worship? I worship out in the woods. You don't have to go to church, preacher. You can worship God in your pajamas in your den. Well, you know what? Both of those things are true. But where is the ultimate place to worship? With your family in his house. Right? My family is coming to my house for Father's Day. We are in God's house to worship him. You should worship him in those other places as well. This should be a priority. We're talking about priorities. We're talking about worship. I will go into thy house with burnt offerings. I will pay thee my vows which my lips have uttered and my mouth hath spoken when I was in trouble. I will offer unto thee burnt sacrifices of fatlings with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks with goats. Think of that. See what? Come and hear all ye that fear God and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. What does God want us to do? He wants to hear our worship. He wants to hear it. Does your wife know you love her? She wants to hear it. Do your children know you love them? They want to hear it. Do you love God? Guess what? He wants to hear it. And then he says this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Do you see that? Now you all knew that verse, didn't you? If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If you have bitterness and envy and strife with anyone, God's not going to hear you, right? If you're not right with them, you're not right with God. That's the deal. And so how do we fix that? Well, we need to be mature and we need to rise above our pettiness and our humanism. What do I mean by that? When I get mad, I like to stay mad. My wife, even when I'm wrong, she apologizes to me right away. Isn't that amazing? When I'm wrong, she apologizes. Yeah, my kids are nodding their head. But what's our problem, Andrea? We like to stay mad for a while, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> If I regard it, it will not hear it. We need to go out of our way to mend those relationships. 
Even if we feel we were the ones that were wrong, we still need to make an effort to mend the relationship. And if that other person doesn't want to make things right, that's their problem. And so what do we need to do sometimes? Sometimes we just need to pray to God and forgive someone even if they won't apologize. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to be their best friend. You don't have to invite them to dinner. But you can't be upset with them. Are you all with me? All right, I'll move on. God will not hear if our relationship with each other is not right. What do we need to do? We need to forgive. I want to just go to Matthew 6. Matthew 6 is where God gives us the method of prayer. And I just want to show you this quickly. Matthew 6, verse 9. He says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verse 10. You all know this. You don't have to turn there. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then what does it say? Yes. Forgive us! How should he forgive us? This is, this is tricky. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So what's the deal if we don't forgive someone? We're not right with God. That's what that verse says. Isn't that amazing? And how does it end? I was never taught this as a child, but thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. What's the very next verse? If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Is there not an emphasis in this context? On forgiveness. Why? God wants us to have the right relationship with one another. So first, we need to learn how to forgive. We need to be a forgiving people. Many times God rebukes me. And he says, do you know what I've forgiven you? How dare you not forgive those around you? God's forgiven me a lot. And we need to forbear with one another. What does forbear mean? It means we've got to put up with each other. Right? Right? We've got to put up with each other. Some of us are harder to put up with. I want you to go to Colossians 3. I know it seems like you've been here for an hour, but I have 15 minutes left. <laughs> Colossians 3. He's talking to people who have been born again by the Spirit of God. Because this is hard to do in the flesh. If ye then be risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above. I have a saying. A couple hundred thousand years from now, it won't make any difference. Can I say that again? A couple hundred thousand years from now, it won't make any difference. That thing that person did to you that you're so upset about, as soon as you hear the trump, you're going to forget all about it. It's true. It's not going to matter. When you think about yourself being a pilgrim and a stranger in a spiritual battlefield, and this is not your home, you're just passing through, our home is in glory, Jesus is coming again, He's going to set up a kingdom, we're going to rule and reign with Him, there'll be social justice, there'll be provision and protection and plenty for a thousand years. Man, what are we getting so bent out of shape about what happens here? Do you ever notice people who've had heart attacks and cancer? They don't sweat the small stuff anymore. Do you ever notice that? Like, aren't you upset about that? That's nothing. They've dealt with big things. We're going to glory. We've been promised an eternity in His presence. Hallelujah. We need to forbear one another. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. 
For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life. Doesn't your Bible say that? When Christ who is our life. Is he your life? Is he your priority? Are you living that first commandment? When he shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. <coughs> then what does it say? Mortify your members upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. I won't explain to you in detail what those are, but they're not good. And let me remind you, they're all sexual. And that's the kind of culture and society we live in today. Covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience in the which he also walked some time when he lived in them. He said, don't judge them. We were just as bad when we were unsaved. However, now that we are children of God, don't go back and revisit those sins. You've already been given victory over them. 60% of adult men watch pornography regularly. What does that lead to? Six out of ten people who are married are not faithful. That's what it leads to. And guess what? Here's the part that bothers me. The percentage is exactly the same for Christians as it is, as it is for non-believers. That ought to scare you. So what's the deal? Those of us who are saved are walking in the Spirit. We are fulfilling the loss of the flesh. And you know from King David, when a Christian is in the flesh, they're capable of any sin the unsaved are capable of. That's right. We were given victory over sin and death. Let's walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says in verse 10, put on the new man, spiritual man, which is renewed in the knowledge of after the image of him that created him. Put on that spiritual man, which is the image of God. <coughs> and then I want you to go down to verse 12. Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, here it is, bowels of mercies. Bowels of mercies. You know what mercy is? It's not getting what you deserve. I deserve to be in hell for all eternity. I know that. But God was merciful to me because I trusted Jesus as my Savior and repented of my sin. He forgave me. I was born again of the Holy Spirit. I received a free gift of everlasting life. But I didn't deserve it. It was all through His grace by faith. And I didn't get what I deserved. And I'm not going to get what I deserved. I'm going to get an eternity in His presence. That's how a loving God He is. That's how merciful He is. When I was a kid, my brother and I, we fought every day. I was... I was bad. And, and I got my share of whoopings. <laughs> but truth be told, I should have gotten beat twice a day, every day, all my life. <laughs> Why didn't I? I know this is hard to believe, but my mom and dad were merciful. They were merciful. Well, we don't get what we deserve. People think, oh, well, you should get what you deserve. No, you shouldn't. He says, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, not pride, not arrogance, not a critical judgmental spirit. And here's what I want you to see. Forbearing one another. Yes. Forbearing one another. 
So let me remind you of something. When you have a problem with someone, when there's some contention in your life, we take it personally. And we get all defensive and self-righteous and indignant. May I remind you that there's someone behind it? That person's not upset with you. That's a joke. You're falling for it. There's a spiritual entity, the power of darkness, who energizes the people around you and me to lure us into contention as a test to see if we love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and if we will love one another as a neighbor and a friend. Like Jesus Christ. It's a task. Forbearing one another. Put up with each other. And if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, put on charity. That's the love of God, which is the bond of perfectness or completeness or maturity. Have God's love. Show God's love. That's what we're talking about. It's the second commandment. Praise God, I'm right on time. <laughs> Let's go right to the conclusion. We talked about this the other night. Go to the book of Philemon. Philemon, verse 3. Do you remember the story behind Philemon? Philemon was a wealthy landowner and he had servants. Part of the Roman Empire. And he had a servant named Onesimus. And what Onesimus did was he stole something valuable from his master Philemon and he ran away. And he ended up in the city of Rome, the capital of the empire. You know, when people are down and out for some reason, they think if they just go to the big city, everything will be all right. When I first moved here, I was working for a company. We had a plant in San Miguel, Mexico. And I went down there a few times. And on one of my trips, the night before I flew home, the general manager of the plant took me into Mexico City. We stayed in Mexico City that night. In fact, we went to a very nice Italian restaurant. But on the way to the restaurant, and you've got to understand, in Mexico, some people are Spaniards, some people are Mexican Indians, and they all look different. You can tell who they are. <coughs> well, there in Mexico City, where there were mostly Spaniards, there was a family of Mexican Indians. And they had come from southern Mexico. They left their farm, they left their home, they left their family. There was a lot of unrest at the time in southern Mexico. So they came to Mexico City thinking that everything was going to be okay. And here's this man and his wife and his two kids on a street corner begging for money. Destitute! And so my boss, the bank manager, who was an American, a gringo, but he spoke perfect Spanish. He excused himself. He talked to this man for 10 minutes. Then he opened his wallet and he gave this man the equivalent of two or three hundred dollars. And he told him, you're not going to find what you're looking for here. You are endangering your family. Take this money and get home as fast as you can. Go back to your farm and make the best of it. So here Onesimus steals from Philemon. He ends up in Rome where there were thousands of slaves who had run away. There was only one problem. There was a guy in Rome who was actually a prisoner and his name was Paul and he was preaching the gospel. 
And guess who gets saved? Onesimus. And after talking to this young man, he finds his story, and Paul's like, Philemon, your former master, he's my buddy. He's my buddy. Here's what I want you to do. Take this letter. What does this letter become? It becomes inspired scripture. He says, take it back to your master and serve him in good conscience as a brother in Christ. Philemon, verse 3. Grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus Christ and all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Paul is sending by uh, Philemon this letter by the hand of Onesimus. And he's telling Philemon, I know you have servants. I know you were wrong, but you are a Christian. Listen to me. We have great joy and consolation in thy love because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake, for love's sake, I beseech thee, as being such a one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. He said, this guy who wronged you is now my son in the Lord. He's a brother in Christ. <laughs> he said, in time past, he was unprofitable to you. Under Roman law, this guy would be in trouble. He is activating his faith by going back. But now he's profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him forever. He'll be with us in glory. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more to thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You know what this is? This is the barometer of the first two commandments. You know what he's saying to Philemon? He's saying, here's your test. Here's your test. Do you love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might? I know you do. So now, I have a test for you. Can you love this brother who wronged you, forgive him, and entreat him above a servant? as an eternal brother in Christ and love him and serve with him in the Lord. Can you pass the test? Well, we know he does because this becomes the inspired word of God. And so what's the first and the greatest commandment? Love God with all your heart. Can you do that? And if you can, Love and us will be a whole lot easier. You might even like me after a while. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I hope that you understand Paul's emphasis in prayer was for the saints. But Paul's agenda was to love and worship God with all his heart. And if you're doing the first one, and that's your priority, the second one's pretty easy. Do you love one another? <coughs> I hope you do. But I hope you love God above all.
And if you're here and you're not saved, you have no clue what I'm talking about. You need to realize that we have all sinned before a holy God. And individually, we must become repentant toward God by receiving Christ as our Savior for sin because He was the perfect and acceptable sacrifice. He died on the cross. He said it is finished. He said, come unto me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a wonderful, wonderful invitation. It's open to all. It's open to all sinners. And it's so easy a child can repent and by faith receive Christ. And then love God. And then love each other. This, this is what our world needs. This is what our world needs. Father, we're grateful for the Word of God. Bless us and be with us. Thank you for saving us. We pray, Father, that we would love you, worship you, serve you, that we would be your children in truth, that we would live by faith and by the Word of God, that we would be led and empowered by your Spirit, and that we would abide in you and know your love and show that love to everyone around us. And we pray that we might use it to live above the world and to give hope to the world around us, which is in chaos because Satan is the God of this world. Deliver them, Lord, and use us to give them the hope of the gospel, the hope that is within us. We pray in Jesus' name.